In this brief tutorial, we'll take a look at analyzing vertical jump height for both counter movement and squat jumps recorded with a force plate and accelerometer. We'll start with the counter movement jump recorded with a force plate. The first thing we'll do is insert a graph to take a look at what the signal looks like. So here we see the characteristic shape where we have the unweighting phase, followed by the braking phase, followed by the propulsion phase, and the flight phase and then obviously our landing and recovery. Now we're gonna take a look at calculating jump height from two different methods. One method using the flight time method where we just look at how long the person was in the air for, and the other one by calculating the impulse or the area under the force time curve throughout the entire jump up to the landing. So looking at this graph, we can pick a start time for our impulse calculations. And let's say that our standing phase is gonna be somewhere around 1,000 samples. So we'll say, so we'll just scroll over the graph and we'll say it's at 1,100 samples. Okay, let's zoom in on this graph a little bit. And now we'll get our takeoff and landing points. So it looks like takeoff happens right around 1702 and landing 1960. Now to simplify our impulse calculations, we can create a cropped data set that goes from our initial standing until our takeoff point. So we can type in the formula equals B1100 colon B1702. Now if we insert a graph of our crop range, we should see that we have just our initial standing up until our point of takeoff. To calculate our takeoff velocity using the flight time method, we can take advantage of the equation that our takeoff velocity will equal gravity, or 9.81 meters per second squared, multiplied by our takeoff time, and divided by 2 because we're only interested in the time to get to the peak of the jump, where velocity is 0. Now, right now we have our time in samples, so we have 1,960 samples at the end of our landing and 1,702 samples at our takeoff. So what we need to do is take the difference between those. So if we say that this cell equals our landing minus our takeoff, we have 258 samples and we can determine our sample rate by taking the inverse of our sample time. So if the difference between samples is point 0, 0, 002, uh, we can either just know that that's 500 samples per second or go 1 divided by our sample time. So if we have 500 samples per second and we have 258 samples, then our actual time will be 258 divided by 500. Now using that formula, we can enter equals 9.81 times 0 0.516 or we can simply select the cell containing our time and just to keep things nice and tidy we can put this in brackets and we'll divide by 2. Now 2.53 meters per second looks like a fairly reasonable takeoff velocity for what I would expect from this jump so let's move on to our calculation for takeoff height. Now to go from our takeoff velocity and calculate our flight height, we can utilize the equation where the flight height will equal the velocity squared divided by two times gravity. So let's set that up as equals bracket, we'll select our takeoff velocity, and then shift six to get the hat two. So this is gonna be squaring our takeoff velocity. And we said that we're gonna divide that by 2 times gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. In this case, we're indicating that we've jumped about 0 0.32 meters, or 0 0.33 meters, or 33 centimeters. Now, utilizing the impulse momentum method, we first need to determine how much impulse there was over the entire jump. So if we want to do that, we can simply take our cropped data, which is in units of newtons, and we'll multiply this by the sample duration, or 1 over 500, or 0 0.002 seconds. So if we go equals C2 times 1 divided by 500, 
We can then double click to fill this down. And we'll just check that we don't have any extra rows. And often what you'll find is that Excel wants to fill in those extra rows for you. So we'll just scroll back up and get rid of those. Just for the sake of keeping things tidy, it won't actually affect your calculations. For a quick way to do that, we can click on our crop data and press Control Shift down. That'll take us to the bottom of the row. Then you can select the extra zeros and we'll Control Shift down again. If you're on a Mac, just replace Control with Command. And then we can just delete this data. To get back up nice and quickly, Control Shift up arrow. So we now have our impulse in Newton seconds. Now that gets us this value over here. So we have the sum of that entire column. So D colon D. But we also need to account for the fact that our body weight is not actually producing an impulse that causes us to jump vertically. So let's take a look at our graph again. If we looked at adding up the area under this entire curve, we can think of a rectangle that is just the force of our body weight being applied throughout the whole thing multiplied by the time. So the impulse due to our body weight is this entire area. What we're actually really interested in is the difference between our measured ground reaction force and the impulse due to body weight. So we first need to determine what this person's body weight is. We can do that by looking at our graph and saying, okay, well, between 500 and 1,000, there's a relatively constant force there. That should give us a good representation of this jumper's body weight. So we'll just go equals average B500 to B1000. We get an average body weight of about 795 newtons. Now to convert body weight to mass, we simply need to divide the body weight in newtons by 9.81 meters per second squared to get our body mass in kilograms. So here we have a body mass of about 81 kilograms. Now to determine our impulse due to body weight, we can simply take the time difference between our takeoff and our initial standing. So in this case, we have 1702 minus 1100. And you'll remember that we're only going to be interested in the time in seconds, not the time in samples. And we can convert to the time in seconds by dividing by 500. So we have 1.204 seconds. So if we multiply the body weight in newtons by the time in seconds, that'll give us our impulse due to body weight in newton seconds. To get our net impulse, which is the difference between the total ground reaction impulse and the impulse due to body weight, we can simply subtract the impulse due to body weight. So here we have about 208 newton seconds of impulse that are accelerating our participant or our jumper vertically. Now to determine the change in velocity, we're going to utilize the impulse momentum relationship. You'll remember that impulse is force times time, momentum is mass times velocity, but that if we cause a change in momentum, that change in momentum will be equal to the impulse applied. Therefore, our impulse is equal to m delta v, or change in velocity, in this case, our takeoff velocity. So all we have to do is rearrange that, and we can divide our net impulse by our body mass in kilograms. So here we have 2.57 meters per second squared, very similar to our takeoff, uh, very similar to our flight height method. Now, one way we can do this very easily is we can copy paste our previous formula. So we've already calculated flight height using our formula here. We can simply copy this cell and paste it down here, and we'll already have our calculation done. Now, when we go to do the same thing for the squat jump, we don't need to redo all of these calculations. All we need to know are where our initial standing, takeoff, 
and our landing times are, and then we'll have to recalculate the body weight and body mass. So let's take a look at this graph. Here we should see that there is no counter movement. So we have a nice flat line followed by our propulsion phase and our takeoff and our landing. So let's recalculate what those values are. So in this case, we're actually interested in zero to 500 for our average body weight. So we'll just go in and edit our formula. So we'll go from B2 to B 500 and we end up with a very similar body mass or body weight as we would expect and a very similar body mass so 795.12 and 81.05 for our initial standing point we might want to just take 500 so this is going to be before we start the jump that's what we're looking for so we'll say that our initial standing is at 500 now let's zoom in on our graph again and we'll get our takeoff time it's at about 808 and our landing is 1055. Okay, so we now have our flight time calculations done for us because those have all updated based off of the copy pasted formulas. So we can confirm that these are using the correct cells. And they are. Now, just like with our counter movement, we're going to have to create a column of cropped data and a column of our impulse. So here we said our start time is going to be 500 and our takeoff is 808. So we can simply apply the same formula that we did before. So we'll say equals B500 colon B808. and then equals our crop data multiplied by our time, which is one over 500. We'll fill those down and then make sure that we don't have any pesky extra zeros at the bottom. Now we just need to update our impulse calculations. So this has updated. So we've got the sum of column D that is in fact our impulse. Our impulse due to body weight needs to be adjusted. So here, because we haven't entered in a formula, you'll see that we need to update this to be the time duration from our takeoff to our initial standing. So the difference between 808 and 500. Now looking at this, let's just double check that our calculations are what we're looking for. And we again have reasonable takeoff velocities and flight heights. Now this is more typical of what we would expect to see of the difference between the flight time method and the impulse momentum method, whereby our flight time method tends to overestimate because the person might tuck their feet up at landing. In our counter movement jump, what must have happened is that our participant took off without fully being fully extended and then landed with their toes fully extended. And this has now resulted in a flight height that is shorter using our flight time method. And if you do want to make your graphs so that your X axis is showing time in seconds instead of samples, which is what you'll want to do for your final presentation, we can simply select those two columns and we'll use time as our X axis. And you'll want to make sure that you do this for both your counter movement and squat jump graphs. Now, when we're looking at our acceleration time plots, we need to do a couple of things differently. So you'll see that we're not presented with a time in seconds. We, in fact, have a time stamp. So what we need to do is determine what our time difference 
in milliseconds is first. And we can do that by taking the difference between adjacent samples. We'll fill that down. And then we'll calculate the cumulative time starting from zero in milliseconds. So we'll just say that this equals our initial starting time of zero plus the sample duration. And we can fill this down and you'll see that this gives us a running total of the time in milliseconds by adding up our previous time plus the new sample duration. To convert to time in seconds, let's adjust this so it's accurate accurately reflects that it's milliseconds. To convert our time in seconds, we simply need to divide everything by 1,000, because there are 1,000 milliseconds in a second. Now let's have a look at our plot. In this case, we're looking at the Y channel of the accelerometer, as this is the channel representing gravity and we'll see that we have the same characteristic shape that we would expect from a counter movement. Things just look a little bit messier. Now we'll see that our starting value is about 9.81 meters per second squared when we're standing up. So we should expect that our flight phase will be indicated when the accelerometer crosses zero. So the start of the flight phase and the end of the flight phase. Now let's go and grab our calculations from our force plate data. We'll just copy everything, even though we won't use it all. Make sure that you paste it into the same relative location. And now that we're here, we can delete the stuff that we don't need. So we're not going to need the body mass, and we're not going to need the body weight in Newtons. All we're going to need is our data from the flight time method. So now all we need to do is determine where our takeoff and landing are. So we'll again zoom in on our graph, scroll over, where the, scroll over where the signal first crosses zero. So here we're at around 1.8067 seconds. So in this case, we can put that time directly in. Now we'll get our time for the landing. So that's at about 2.3927. And this time, if we look back to our squat jump calculations, the time that we're interested in needs to be in the column N and beside the time for our landing sample. So as long as we keep the relative references for our calculations, everything should work fine. So here we'll just take the difference of these times in seconds, and we have our calculated time. Now what we'll see here is that due to the noise that we have in the signal, we're not going to have as accurate of a representation of our jump height. Now if we were to guess what's happening here, likely what we're seeing is the person's back extending. And so if we try just shifting our calculations a little bit, we can say that this big spike might have been a result of the person's back flying up at a high rate. So we'll take the next time we cross zero. So that's 1.9546. And we'll see that we're getting a bit more reasonable of a value. But either way, what we notice is that the noise due to the accelerometer makes it much more difficult than when we're dealing with the nice clean signal that we have here with the force plate. So one of the challenges of using accelerometers is that often it's difficult to work with your raw data. If we were to apply a low pass filter to this data, it would make it much simpler to identify our locations that we're interested in.